famous as the first temple of black sect tantric Buddhism in the United States. It was founded in 1986 by His Holiness Grand Master Thomas Lem Yun Rinpoche, who passed away last year here in Berkeley, California. This is the fourth stage of black sect tantric Buddhism, a reformist and revolutionary denomination of Buddhism with much older roots in the shamanistic Bon religion of Tibet, stretching back some 18,000 years to its founder, Tanpa Shurab. Thomas Lin Yun Rinpoche was the first to bring feng shui as we know it to the Western world. Most of the books on feng shui that you see in bookstores have been written by his students. Today we talk with Master Lin Yun's successor, Kadro Crystal Chu Rinpoche. She talks about her lineage in black sect Tantric Buddhism and about the spiritual side of feng shui, from which derive the feng shui principles that so many of us today are aware of. The main monastery of the Bam is in India. So their supreme head, His Holiness Longtok Tempe Nima, he is the uh, uh, supreme leader, now resides in India in their principal monastery called Mary Monastery. And His Holiness, he is uh, taught by his teacher of Black Sect Tantra Buddhism. After uh, the uh, ancient bomb is called bomb even now the bomb but the later when they assimilated with the Buddhism and in Chinese Chinese people call them as black sect tantric Buddhism so his holiness class um, uh, uh, divide them into four phases ancient bomb is the first stage and the second stage is uh, uh, assimilation of both religion and the third stage of Black Sect Tantra Buddhism is after the second stage went into China. And after the second stage went to China, it uh, further absorbed Chinese uh, philosophies, Chinese folkloric practices, and uh, feng shui, yi jing, divination, astrology, uh, healing, uh, so forth. And that is uh, His Holiness teachers where they are, they were at the third stage. And His Holiness learned from his teachers from the third stage, and he evolves the religion into the fourth stage, and he brought it over to the Western world. So that is the fourth stage. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, his teachings has incorporated a lot of modern knowledge, and he made all his teachings more adapt to the modern lives. Yeah, more, so, more understandable to the Western mind. Right, and more fit into our daily lives. Right. Yeah. So His Honan's Grand Master, he is the founder of a Black Sect Tantra Buddhism at its fourth stage. He is also the founder of a Black Sect Tantric Buddhist Feng Shui school. Mm -hmm. So he brought the Feng Shui to the Western world. Yeah. Was, were there any Feng Shui schools in the United States before His Holiness arrived here? That I'm not... Uh, quite familiar, but most of them, I think they are not, even some of the feng shui schools brought, or the uh, theories introduced to U.S., mm -hmm. but not as popular, mm -hmm. never gets popular. Right. And feng shui uh, began to be known to people, to the Westerners, because of his home and his grandmaster's right. introduction yeah. of his theories. Mm -hmm. Because feng shui is very ancient knowledge, uh, ancient knowledge, Chinese knowledge and wisdom, and it's thousands centuries old, uh, which um, uh, accord, uh, during the, the, the course of history had developed into many different schools mm -hmm. and approaches. Mm -hmm. And His Holiness Feng Shui Theory is classified as Black Sect Tantric Buddhist Feng Shui uh, School or Feng Shui Theories, which is very unique from all other traditional ones. So only his feng shui theories get so popular and more well accepted yes. uh, in the US. Yes. I know that you know. as I go into bookstores, I, I, I suddenly realize that 
all of the authors of these feng shui books have actually studied with uh, yes, His Holiness here. Yes, yes, That's impressive. Yes, so that's why the feng shui gets popular mm -hmm. and more known to the Westerners because of His Holiness. Mm -hmm. He introduced and brought the feng shui to the Western world. And you are his successor? I'm his successor, his successor and his student and his, as well his disciple. Mm -hmm. And I have learned uh, from His Holiness almost 30 years. And I've been helped him yeah, more than 25 years. Right. How did you first become interested in feng shui? I took his class and I was fascinated by all of his teachings. And I began to be very interested in uh, Buddhist teachings, Buddhist uh, scriptures, uh, doctrines, and also the feng shui, folkloric practices. So all his teachings, I'm very interested mm -hmm. to it. Yeah, now we are presently in the temple on Russell Street and I have uh, videoed several of your shrines here which are really very beautiful and and soothing and I think His Holiness had a particular liking for this particular property on Russell Street. Could you show us around and, and show us the feng shui principles which he found so appropriate for this site? Yeah, shall we go outside? Yes. I'll just point okay. it out to you. All right. Okay, from the feng shui perspective, um, we look at the uh, elevation of this site, the, where the temple is. It's situated on the uh, almost the highest uh, point uh, on this Russell Street. And now Russell Street is kind of sloping down to the other side. So this temple is built on the high side of this street. His Holiness Grandmaster Ling commented this um, location. We are right on top of a dragon head, uh, which is very auspicious. And uh, this architect somehow took this uh, sloping lot and built the house on the high side of this lot. Our back door is um, on the, uh, street level. It's leveled with the streets, but from uh, our uh, where our address is, the Russell Street, and it, it takes 49 steps going up, and also with high pillars. So, uh, well, first of all, it's right on top of the Dragon Head. And on dra Dragon Head, that means you hold the power. You control it, the situation. Is 49 you have an auspicious number? 49. Uh, <laughs> It is sort of, okay. sort of auspicious numbers, but also with the steps and you're going higher and higher. That's also one of the good feng shui, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in terms of the feng shui analysis. Mm -hmm. So, may I ask what these uh, circles are down here? Okay. Uh, okay, the circles uh, down here were painted on the uh, ground. Those are also one of the feng shui um, uh, cures. We call it feng shui cures, or one of, one of the feng shui solutions to enhance the whole household, in the look of whole household, especially in the financial wealth aspect. And the circles here actually are the feng shui uh, objects. It's called 10 emperor coins. And we paint it here, down here, symbolizes we bring in the wealth to the house. The pillars here is strong and tall, big enough, and it elevates, it uh, uplifts the chi of the house, uplifts the feng shui of the house as well as the residents, mm -hmm. occupants who live in this house. And what about the flags? The flags are also the feng shui uh, cures to uh, uplift the chi of the house. You can see two stone lions here. Uh, His Holiness purposely put them here to as protectors to guard the house. and. Um, uh, dispel and avoid all the negative or evil energy coming to the house. So in the feng shui perspective, those are the great protectors. Now the two pine trees um, standing right in front of the house, those two, His Holiness, 
access to tall pine trees like natural guardian uh, protecting us and also uh, in Chinese saying uh, the long branches from the big trunk of the pine trees like they are inviting guests coming over and that all symbolizes uplifting our energy and uh, will uh, enlarge, expand our community. If we look down from here up to uh, uh, look up of our building, the temple. Now we're about halfway of the steps. If we're really looking down from on the street, uh, look up, and you can you have you will have the uh, uh, grandeur and magnificent look of the temple, and that shows the strength and the power uh, and the feng shui perspective of this temple and how they situated high above. And you have a cultural center, I think, on Euclid? Yes. Could we I see like that, please? Sure. I would like to invite you over to our culture center, the other location of our temple in Berkeley. Here is the location of our cultural center. Uh, we hold uh, quite a few events, Buddhist teachings here um, for Low small assembly, but in terms of our classes, workshops, uh, <coughs> this uh, location not enough to accommodate uh, 80, 100 people or over 100, then we have to rent the classroom somewhere else. But this is our <coughs> second shrine here in Berkeley, and you see the throne that uh, we have two beautiful thrones built up, and this is very traditional. Uh, Tibetan uh, <coughs> teachers, the high, the spiritual teachers, high lamas, they are they have enthroned and they are able to sit up at, on, uh, at the uh, at the throne to give teachings, and this is um, used to be uh, my throne and uh, my seat over here, and that is His Holiness' seat and His throne, because uh, His Holiness Grandmaster Yun. Uh, and myself in 1998 were enthroned and consecrated, consecrated by His Holiness Longtak Tempi Nyingma, the Supreme Head of the Bam tradition, to recognize uh, His Holiness Grandmaster Ling and myself it used to be maybe in our previous lives uh, in the lineage of the Bam tradition. What does feng shui mean? Feng shui is an ancient knowledge, um, uh, ancient Chinese uh, knowledge. It uh, developed through Chinese ancestors' wisdom and their uh, experiences. Uh, they developed this knowledge how to deal with their living and working environments. They somehow detected the environments or the qi or your surroundings would have a tremendous impact on your, your life. So the human beings, uh, his holiness, Grandmaster Yun gave a definition to what feng shui is, and he says human beings use the known knowledge to them at the time to build, to create, and to adjust their working and living environments to f make the environments fit for their life and make them more inhabitable and make their life happier. And that is the, that knowledge is feng shui. So now, <clears throat> if we study the um, with, uh, so that means we study the uh, impact or the uh, from the our living working environment, and also we study how can we adjust through the adjustment of our working living environments to make our life better and resolve our life daily life problems, and that kind of knowledge is feng shui. Mm -hmm. If you could say that uh, a feng shui practitioner has one primary intention, what would that intention be? That, uh, that's the very important message and advice from His Holiness, 
Grandmaster Lin Yun. He advised all his feng shui students, uh, all his disciples uh, and students who learn uh, with him. Uh, his advice is you always use your heart and your kindness to help people out, to help them resolve their problems. And using your, the knowledge, knowledge you learn from me, whether it's a feng shui or it's a transcendental cures or the uh, adjustment methods of your qi or any spiritual cultivation, you have to use, use loving, kind heart to help them out. Instead of uh, making profits, you don't use the knowledge as the, um, as the mean to make your own big profits. Don't let people mistakenly think you are making money on them. Uh, talk to us about the visible and the invisible aspects as taught by Professor Lin Yun. Okay, great. Um, His Holiness, uh, the Black Sect Tantric uh, Buddhist uh, Feng Shui theories or Feng Shui schools, founded and developed by His Holiness Grandmaster Lin Yun. And um, the theory is actually very unique from and very different from all other traditional feng shui schools or approaches. So basically, he divided all the feng shui elements into visible uh, aspect and an invisible aspect. Visible aspects, visible elements include the uh, qi of the land, and uh, uh, shape of the lot, shape of the house, the floor plan, and others. And other, under others, we can divide them into two big categories. Uh, those are the internal factors, feng shui factors, and external feng shui factors. And uh, internal factors including some of the architectural structures, such as the pillars, posts, inside a house, the exposed beams and uh, uh, staircase or your uh, desk and uh, uh, stove, dining table and your bed uh, placements of those. Uh, those are important and about the color of the house and interior and exterior. And so all, all of those are the uh, uh, internal factors. And, exter and also the, um, any sharp angles inside the house or only, uh, and all the doors, um, alignment of the doors, and also important. Um, and for the external factors, including around your house, what's your situation of your neighborhood, any temples, church, they do a lot of funerals, or there's a bridge, uh, or it's some of the roadways around the house and how they're, you know, situated there towards your house and um, waterways around the house, so forth. So, the ex and also the, uh, the color and um, uh, 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 the energy, you know, and so th that's a lot of it involved even through your naked eyes, those visible elements that you can see physically existed. That for uh, like chi of the land, how do you see the chi of the land? Then you can look from the, uh, the animals around and the vegetation around and the people in your neighborhood, you know, how's their, uh, uh, how they're in, uh, or you can tell from the events happens you know occurrences happened or even from the spiritual things happen around the area then you can tell whether chi of the land is good or not and of course of course different shape of the lot different shape of the house incorporates tells you the different feng shui uh, feng shui situations good or not so those are the visible elements and the invisible elements more involved in the spiritual blessings and purifications. And for example, like eight trigrams, we don't use the um, compass to place the eight trigrams. The eight trigrams in your heart. We orient eight trigrams according to where your door opens, where it's situated, and you align, orient the eight trigrams according, you know, from the door. Uh, and the door lines, and then how you orient it. 
and you have to know the body, uh, speech, and mind rituals to bestow in the blessings when you do all the cures. And um, also we pay attention, invisible elements, what the history of the house. If you move into the house, what has happened, you know, for the previous owners? Are they, is there any death in this household or any uh, breaking, you know, any bad things, murdered? So those, the history of the house is important or the owner live in the house, a previous owner running to bankruptcy then you move into the house, you inherit the chi, the bad chi, I mean the, the bankruptcy chi from the previous owner. And also it, there's a side purification, you dispel all the negative energy around your house and the neighborhood, and also you can uplift using the uh, certain blessing ways, like nine star path, tracing the nine star path, or we call this a door alignment way, or uh, uh, interior and exterior chi adjustments of the house, of the building. And those are, you don't see, you don't have to change or do the cure from the physical architecture structure, but just along with the blessing, uh, certain rituals, uh, those are the invisible aspect. Can you give us uh, one example of how we can clear negative energy? Is there a ritual that you could talk about? Okay, yeah, there are actually quite a few ways. Then um, if uh, the simplest way is you take a bowl of uncooked rice and mix it up with a, a pinch of a cinnabar powder, which is a Chinese herbal mineral medicine, uh, and uh, add in some strong liquor. And you mix them together and chant it with uh, uh, 108 times the mantras, or 10 different mantras, or 108 times of a six syllable mantra. You use your middle finger to mix them up, and you spring the rice, <coughs> spring uh, to the entire the corner, each corner of the house. And along with the visualization, the, uh, we call it the, the uh, six syllable uh, praying wheels, along with the rice, to bless the house and visualize, dispel, and get rid of all the bad energy or evil energy of the house. And uh, instead, we sowing the seeds of a blessedness or an auspiciousness to the house and to uplift the chi and also to. Uh, bestowing a lot of blessings into the house. It seems to me that that might work for um, an, a person with an Asian mindset where those symbols have meaning, but uh, would that also work equally as well to a Westerner for whom those symbols um, have no particular associations? Well, it is, yeah, it is applicable to everybody because of the rituals and all these objects and all the uh, uh, applications, remedies. It sounds from, uh, in the Chinese way, we have an explanation, but not, may not, you know, familiar to the Westerners. But somehow, even this, because the feng shui knowledge and all the Chinese folkloric practices developed in Chinese history, and Chinese has a long-standing history for 5,000 years, so all this rituals and knowledge is sort of um, uh, the, the essence of our ancestors' wisdom and their life experiences. Mm -hmm. So it's all incorporated into more sy uh, systematically in this, uh, the knowledge and then passed on thousands and thousands of years. Mm -hmm. So it's been proved it's, it's effective. But nevertheless, faith plays a very important part in this. That's right, that's yeah. right. But from your, if you, uh, well, Faith is uh, important, but as well as, um, well, faith to lead you accept the new knowledge if it, your uh, person's uh, open-minded enough, but also through your practice. If you physically to do the feng shui adjustments and you can see what the result is, and the result is very positive, and then, of course, that through your experimental or empirical kind of experience, 
and you, the person will get uh, accept the knowledge. So that's why the His Holiness Grandmaster Lin Black Sack Tantric Buddhist Feng Shui theories get so popular in Western world because a lot of students they do go back to practice and they found that it's very effective and it's very helpful and help them to resolve a lot of problems would enhance their lives and sometimes even life changing at the uh, pivotal point. So they start to believe in. If they go back, they learn the knowledge and they go back and there's no effect. It's no effective. It doesn't give you any good result. Of course, the people will not believe in feng shui. So all of the practitioners, all the students, if they believe in feng shui, most of them because they have practiced it and then they get good results. Uh, Western science limits itself to the measurable. How do you deal with science's dismissal of non-material realities? Well, of course, um, some of the people, not only Westerners, science, you know, people who study sciences, and I think it really depends on their spiritual uh, connection uh, with the religious faith and religious spiritual aspect of their lives. Some people, they don't believe in any religion. They don't believe in any spiritual knowledge or they don't believe in any uh, things they cannot see, they cannot touch, they cannot measure. Um, so we don't force people to believe all the things they don't, they don't, they don't want to believe. And we wanted to connect the people. They have a, a willingness and eagerness to learn new knowledge and to learn to uh, open up their horizon of the uh, the knowledge uh, in the spiritual aspects, in the transcendental aspects, and take them uh, as well as feng shui, you know, astrology as a new knowledge to learn. Uh -huh.